Good morning. Delighted to see you all here today. Uh, I'd like to talk about two things with you. One is the incredibly rapid pace of change, particularly in computing and communications. And two is why, as Mainers, we are historically and culturally prepared to deal with that and, and to make it a real opportunity. So why should you care about this change and what happens in the main economy? Interesting statistic. 80% of the jobs you guys are going to apply for in the next 20 years haven't been invented yet. So that means you can't be taught how to do this job or that job. Instead, you have to develop these really transferable skills, like things like critical thinking and problem solving and collaboration, communication, things that need to happen in, in every single job uh, in order to be successful. So let's talk about this pace of change business a little bit. Here's, here's the first cell phone. Now, the first cell phone call was actually completed, completed in 1973, but you couldn't buy a cell phone until 1983. And when you did, it was a monster. It was 10 inches long, it weighed two and a half pounds, it cost 4,000 bucks, and all it did was make phone calls. So fast forward to 2014. So now we got, we, we got the same device, five inches long, less than four ounces, 200 bucks with a two-year data plan, and it does amazing things. So that's what's happened in a really short interval of space. And uh, in 1991, the first cell phone network was fired up so people could actually talk to each other via their cell phones. And, and this year, there are 6 billion cell phone subscriptions. Think about that for a second. There's only 7.1 billion people on the planet and not all of them have cell phones. So that's where we've come with cell phones. Now let's talk about the World Wide Web. First website went up in 1991. For some of us in this room, that doesn't seem like that long ago. Uh, it, by 1994, the web had grown to 10,000 websites. That's, that's a pretty quick acceleration. However, today, there are 644 million sites on the World Wide Web. And uh, you can't quite see the bottom of this slide, but 34% of the global population is connected to the World Wide Web. And I can think about that because there's a whole lot of people who can't be connected to the web. So it's, it's just think of what these, these curves look like. Now let's talk about something that has happened in a fraction of your li lifetimes, social media. So um, 2004, 10 years ago, Mark Zuckerberg launches Facebook. By 2012, he's got a billion subscribers. Similarly, in 2006, the first tweet was sent. It took him just three years to record one billion tweets. One billion of anything is a lot. However, um, by 2012, Twitter was recording one billion tweets per week, so growing like crazy. Similarly, the Apple App Store, so you could buy games and stuff for your phone, it, it only opened in 2008. And uh, by 2013, they'd hit 40 billion downloads. Now, this is kind of interesting because 20 billion, or half of them, happened in the last 12 months. And Apple just released its figures last week. It turns out that 3 billion of those 20 billion happened in the month of December. So the point is, picture graphing this thing, and it just looks like this. So that's kind of interesting. Got a question for you. Anybody here? Raise your hand if you've ever taken a photograph. Great, most everybody has. I got a harder question for you. Raise your hand if you've taken a photograph with a film camera. Well, still, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. That's probably half of you. So uh, here's an interesting statistic. Uh, last year, 380 billion photographs were taken. So what I find really interesting about that is that's 10% of all the photographs people have ever taken since 1827, and it's because we now all have a camera in our pocket. So speaking of photography, I want to jump over to my claim that Maine is well suited to respond to this pace of rapid change. Anybody here ever ski at Sugarloaf? It's near Kingfield. A couple of brothers, twin brothers, the Stanley brothers, grew up there. It used to be that you wanted, when you wanted to take a photograph, it was this really cumbersome process. You had this glass plate, and you had to go out into the field, picture this black hood, and you had to paint it with this liquid chemical, and the chemical had to be just right, and it had to be just the right thickness, and then you got to take just one frame. Not exactly quick and fast. So these guys invented a dry plate process. And it was very, very successful, and it made it a lot easier to take photographs. And it was so good that a guy named George Eastman bought the process from them. And here, here's another example of how fast things are changing. Until a few years ago, Kodak was a household name. 
because they sold us originally our cameras and all along the way the film to put in our cameras to take pictures. And now I suspect there are even people in this room who would say, Kodak, hmm, not a company I've heard of because you don't hear of them very much because the world has changed and they didn't change with it. So key point about inventors, if a, if a person invents one thing, it's highly likely that that person is going to invent other things. It's kind of the inventive mind. So the Stanley brothers made a lot of money selling their film process, and they decided that they wanted to build steam cars. Kind of a crazy thing to do out of Kingfield, Maine, but they did it anyway. And here's F.O. and his wife, and they're driving up Mount Washington. This was the first motorized vehicle to ascend Mount Washington. Well, car people tend to have this other thing where they like to go fast. So they were doing pretty well, so they said, let's go for the world land speed record for steam vehicles. So they build this car, and, and look at when this was, this is 1906, this was the turn of the last century, this was a long time ago. They made that car go 127.7 miles per hour, that's fast today. So people who are into cars are always trying to beat somebody else's record. So you'd think, eh, enhancements in aerodynamics, material science, propulsion systems, I mean in five years somebody probably beat that record, right? It didn't get beaten for 104 years until 2010, and then the speed only went up by 11 miles an hour. So these, these guys from Kingfield were, were, were pretty crazy. And here's another guy. Uh, anybody know where Sangerville is? Over near Dover Foxcroft, right. And this is Sir Hiram Maxim, and he invented the machine gun. Now, to the point, if you invent one thing, you might invent others. He got his first patent when he was 26 years old for a hair curling iron. He got his next patent for a locomotive headlight. Then he got another patent for, of all things, a lightweight steam engine to propel airplanes. And then, of course, he invented the machine gun. And uh, you know how, like, you have a class project, and it takes you a couple of months, and you have to work really hard, and it's like especially the night before, and you take your project in, and you've done a really good job on it, and you get a good grade, and your parents are really proud of you. I love this photograph. This is his mom and dad and his wife, and they're out in the backyard test firing the machine gun, and um, they're, they're really, really really proud of, of Hiram, so it's a good incentive. Now, if you live in Maine, uh, there's, there's a lot of water around us, so you get thinking about, you somehow relate to the coast a lot of times. One of the things we do in Maine that I thought you'd do everywhere that where there was water but you don't is build ships. So this gets to my point that Maine is, is and Mainers are really well suited and have a lot of experience at being global. So this ship was built in 1872. Amazing fact. In 1870, 10% of all the licensed sea captains in the United States came from one town, Searsport, Maine. I'd love to know the number if you took all the coastal towns where sea captains came from. And not only did these guys have to understand how to build a ship, then they had to crew the ship, and then they had to do business in ports around the world. And Searsport, Maine was known in every port around the world because so many sea captains came from there. Another kind of household word around here uh, is, is Bath Ironworks. They've been around for, I think it's 134 years now, and they've built a lot of ships. And very resourceful in doing what they need to do when they need to do it. These are big, these are destroyers in World War II. They launch a new ship every 17 days. Think about that, that's amazing. So then in the late 60s, when the defense budget wasn't quite what it had always been, but they wanted to keep employing people, they saw this opportunity to bid on these cargo ships, and they said, oh, we build ships, we can figure that out. So sure enough, they started building these ships. Now, today, the US Navy is building the most sophisticated floating vessel that it has ever been conceived. It's called the DDG-1000. It is so expensive, $1.4 billion for one ship, that the Navy's only going to build three of them, but Bath Ironworks is going to build all three. So, but, but Bath Ironworks is not the only Maine-based company that is nimble and lives by its wits. There's a company uh, headquartered in Pittsfield. It's called Chinbro, started by four brothers in 1949. They bought some dump trucks. And basically what they did is build these really high-quality bridges. So they branched out from bridge building in Maine to New England and then the East Coast. And they realized that they had some gaps to fill in and they kind of had to do some other stuff. So there was this company down on the Gulf Coast who was building these oil exploration rigs for a Brazilian oil company, very sophisticated, 12,000 tons, behemoths. And that company in the US went bankrupt. And Chimbro said, well, we've never built oil rigs before, but geez, we build paper mills and they're really complicated. We could probably figure it out. So they bid on the job and they got it. And that's kind of what I mean about Maine people having a lot of skills to bring to the party, but also some confidence and some willingness to try new stuff. 
Now, Chinbro is still making headlines on the Portland waterfront. Anybody seen this? Anybody know what this is? It's Google's new barge to promote Google Glass. There's two of them. One's going to be on the West Coast, one on the East Coast. And here's this construction company in Pittsfield, Maine, who got hired by Google to outfit their barge. Now, Chinpro's never built a retail space before, and who would think that bridge builders would go to work for Google, but there they are on the Portland waterfront, and it's really epic. And it's, it's not the only new thing they've jumped into. These are very large, there are three of these big windmills. Um, it's called the Fox Island Wind Project on Vinyl Haven to generate electricity, because of course electricity is really expensive out there, and there's a lot of wind. So as soon as Chimbro saw that these windmills were going to get installed, they said, well, geez, we could do that. And, you know, now they have a company that installs windmills. And it's funny, as I was preparing this talk, um, sort of new bits kept coming up. So literally, I didn't know about this when I sat down to write this talk, but there was a story. There's a, the first offshore wind project in Maine, and you're going to hear a lot more about offshore wind today from the master. Um, and... Uh, and so this is the first one. It's called Cape Wind. They're going to be 130 really big turbines. Siemens, which is a German company, got the job to build the, the turbines and the towers, but they hired Chinbro to do all the work to connect these 130 windmills together and to get the power on shore and have it do what it's supposed to do when it gets here. And just that piece, just the electrical piece for this project, the Chinbro contract, $100 million. So, so very interesting because they hadn't done that before either, but they said, huh, we know enough that we can figure that out. So uh, I mentioned, uh, uh, well, I didn't actually name it, but uh, Habib is going to be here, and he's going to be talking about the Deep Sea Wind Consortium. What is so clever about what Habib has done is he's pulled together all the interested parties, and instead of setting up this big competitive thing, so for instance, Bath Ironworks and Chinbro are both part of the Deep Sea Wind Consortium. So Maine is going ahead with a single voice to see if we can't build ocean windmills, but I, but I really want to let Habib talk about it because he knows way more than I do. So now let's get back to education because you guys are in school and something different is going to happen in the next four years. So what does this all mean for you? Well, when you were in the seventh and eighth grade, you were issued your own laptop computer, and many of you all the way through high school have continued to have your own computer connected to high-speed internet access in your classrooms. This was a very interesting experiment launched by then-Governor Angus King, who believed that if every Maine child knew how to use a computer, he or she would be better prepared for life and work in the 21st century. And I'd say his instincts were pretty good. Here's an interesting little factoid while 11% of children between the ages of two and five can tie their own shoes, it turns out that 70% of that same group of kids know how to use a tablet computer. So here's my ambition for Maine's public education system. Let's say it's five or six years from now, and you're applying for your first kind of real job, and it's a job you're really excited about, and you've made it all the way to the finalist pool. There are three of you. And just imagine the hiring committee is sitting around the big wooden conference table, and instead of saying, I think we should hire her because she has a degree in information technology, what if they said, I think we should hire her because she's from Maine? That's my ambition for each one of you. Thank you.